G'day and welcome to the episode, episode 144. That's a lot of episodes under the belt. Every week we've been doing this. My name I is know, Brad. it's crazy. It's crazy. crazy. It's, well, it's not crazy. It's 12 consistent. times 12 is 144. If we did 12, yeah. Actually, it's not relevant. That's not a relevant comp. Yeah, so we've done 144. Me, tell me more about that, man. Yeah, it means um, nothing. Actually, just a <laughs> random thought in my head. That's fine. <laughs> uh, this is the Growth Whispers. I'm Brad Giles in Australia. And uh, the the math genius on the other side is <laughs> Kevin Lawrence in Canada, in Vancouver, <laughs> on the West Coast. West is best. Um, yeah, 2023, a good year. Today, we're talking about cash. Could be the most boring episode. It but could be the most important, the most I think important. So. Yes. So we always like to begin each episode with a word or phrase of the day. Kev, what might be your word or phrase of the day? Show me the money. Good old Jerry Maguire from that movie. I just love that movie. Both the quotes, you know, you complete me, him and Rene, um, Tom Cruise and Renee Zellweger. But um, but the, the the phrase "show me the money," the football player that he's the agent for, and you know at at the end of the day, it's business, and you got to be able to show the money. And some businesses show the money better; they provide a better return mathematically, or they actually generate more cash. But if you're building a business and it doesn't generate cash, that's usually not a lot of fun, unless you're a tech company growing. But even now. Those businesses more more than ever need to generate cash or or close to generating cash. So yeah, show me the money. Uh, discipline for myself, just discipline of the boring basics. You know, uh, reflecting back before Christmas, there was just a couple of examples that come to mind where some of the teams that I work with let a bit of discipline slip, and mm. um, and they they paid the price as a result. So yeah, it's just discipline. We must maintain the discipline. And it's not always easy, but it is very important. Yeah. The discipline of keep showing the money. Keep showing me the money. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like I should be breaking out into song, but that's not going to happen. All right. Yeah. So we're looking at 2023 and it's interesting. Okay. We're looking forward mm. to this looking forward to this year. And we're we're really getting a sense. There's some pundits out there, pundits out there who are saying, Look, we're, we're heading into a recession. Maybe there's a 70% chance. We don't know. Okay, we're not here to, to, to give you a perspective on that, but we are here to give you a perspective about what you need to do if something happens and how do you deal with that, specifically in the lens of cash this yes. week. Um, because profitable businesses go bust all the time. Okay, profit yes. is important and fine but it's the cash or the, the the absence of cash that stops all the cogs turning and i love this quote that you've got in in our notes kev which is profit is an opinion but cash is a fact it's the only true thing in business it is the you can mess around with all the other stuff creative accounting amortizing things providing for things you know, uh, accruals, all kinds of things that you can do with profitability. But yeah. cash, you just open up the account and see what's there today. And 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 I, and I want to start us off with a story of, you know, an amazing, fiery entrepreneur I worked with, and I won't even say the country. Um, and, you know, I went and I did uh, a session for his team on Rockefeller Habits at the time back in the day. Mm. And, you know, he was successful. He was a guy who worked on the factory floor and then bought the business. And Sweet. which is pretty impressive. Yeah, he was a dynamic guy. I loved him. Fiery, aggressive, good guy. And uh, so a few months later, he calls me, says, Kevin, we need to meet. I said, okay, what's going on? He goes, well, I think I'm going bankrupt. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I don't have any cash left. You know, I normally have six, seven, eight million dollars of cash and I got none. And I'm like, okay. And I said, well, you know, I'm really busy. And he goes, no, no, I need to meet you this week. I'm like, okay. Cause you told me this cash thing and I don't know what's going on. I said, okay. I said, well, I'm going to be in Chicago. Uh, yep. I'll be there. And you know, this guy had his own plane. Like he was doing okay. He was doing more than okay. But this way he had a, 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 a business that was close to hundred million of revenue and about 20 million a year of EBITDA. So healthy, healthy business, according to what his accountant told us. So long story short, he flies to Chicago in his own plane. 
we go and stay in Trump, the Trump uh, hotel in mm -hmm. Chicago, which was spectacular. We both got massive suites. It was great. So we go to have our so, meeting. So that's where the cash went. <laughs> exactly. That's what you would think. So we go to have our meeting and I dig in and I, and I said, so look, I said, look, I have this cash analysis. Please get your CFO to run the numbers. And it's from this HBR article. How fast can your company afford to grow? Yep. And it's got the cash conversion cycle in it as the base, a few other calculations. And so he pulls up the stuff and I look at it. It kind of looked like garbage. The it didn't make any sense. I said, well, just, just, let's just, just tell me what's going on here. Like what happened? And we start pulling back and we're, you know, we got, we booked a day. I extended my trip for a day so I could spend the day with him. Where's it? Maybe a morning. I don't remember which might've been a morning. It was a morning. Um, and we're like 42 minutes in and he goes and tells me the story. He goes, Kevin, I don't know. I should have more cash. I go, why? He says, because I went to my number one supplier, which is 50% of my costs. It's about 50 million a year I spend on the one supplier. Yeah, you're putting Brad's putting his head down for those of you that aren't on camera, because Brad knows where, where the movie it's going. is. It is. And he goes, and I negotiated a 4% discount. I'm like, that's awesome. How'd you get it? All I had to do was, was pay him a little bit earlier. I used to have 60 day payment terms. Now I have 15 day payment terms. So in case you haven't got the story yet, if you spend $50 million a year on a raw material and you get a 4% discount, that's two, per, 2 million of savings. It should be, it's 2 million of theoretical profit, but if you're basically spending $4 million a month on this thing, just over 4 million, and you pay in eight or nine weeks, and now you have to pay in two, that means that you have to come up with a lump of a lump of cash that is equivalent to about six to seven million dollars. Remember the beginning of the story is he thought he had about six to seven. He used to have six to eight million dollars of cash, and now he had zero. So, long story short, I had to find a very nice way to not make him feel foolish. He just didn't, he didn't know, he didn't understand cash. I said, just so you know, and I found I took a breath, I thought about it. I said, here's the, in simple math, you just prepaid six to seven million dollars to save the two million dollars. And I mapped it out for him. His jaw hit the floor. He's like, why did my CFO tell me this? I said, that's the excellent question. That's a real question. Why didn't your CFO tell you that you were going to cripple the company for cash because of the beautiful discount that you got? So long story short, we worked through some stuff, built out some other strategies, also talked about replacing his CFO. Uh, and then um, he was able to go, and I believe he, he was able to undo the terms but uh, keep half of the discount. So he kept 2% discount, which was a million bucks a year, yeah. but then pushed the terms back to 60 days. And it took about three months, everything washed out of the system and he was fine again. And actually went on to build the business from a hundred million of revenue to a billion of revenue. And did, like he did spectacularly well. But the point of it is he didn't know. Like a lot of executives, he was chasing profit and destroyed cash without realizing what he had done. Yeah. That is awesome. So 50 million divided by 52 weeks multiplied by six weeks is how you get to just about 6 million, 5.7, 5.8 million. And yeah, that's fine. But that's the investment to get that discount. If you're willing to put $6 million in to make an extra $2 million um, profit, which might make sense, if, right. if, if, if then that's great. But if you've got 12 million in the bank and you can give away six, and we'd have to do the return on capital, $2 million a year on six. I'll do that. That's about a 30% return, 33% return on capital. Yeah. I'll do that deal all day, every day. Yeah. If I have 12 million in the bank and I can kiss 6 million goodbye, yeah, yeah, or yeah. if I can borrow it from the bank at 5% back in the day, or even now six or seven, but I'm getting 30% annually, absolutely. freaking lootly. So the it, it, it's it it actually is a wise decision only if you have extra cash in hand or access to cheap cash because of the return on capital it generates. But still, 
It's about knowing and understanding these levers really, really well. It is so important before you make those big decisions to think about what's the impact on cash. That's such a good story, Kev. I'm so glad that we opened with that. There's a manufacturing company that I, I work with and we, we've been growing. It's been good. We've been growing. It's been going well. Um, but um, the focus and understanding of gross margin and its relationship to working capital haven't been as strong as they would. I'd, I'd say that in my experience for most entrepreneurs as they're, let's say, you know, finding their feet, working capital is one of the things that they understand the least and yet is yes. one of the most important things because that's how they grow broke, right? Um, and so that's really what we're talking about today is, is looking into 2023 as we look to the remainder of this year, um, how can we win how can we right how can we improve our cash position and maybe evolve our business model so that we can generate cash right. in a more effective manner or just on it's kind of like playing with with sharp knives you kind of should know what you're doing before you start throwing them around cash is the core of a business it's everything and most people have no clue and the amount of people that We've had the amount of CFOs that I, from what I understand, we I've had to teach cash to. They know the accounting version of it, but not the business operational version. It, it, CFOs are a big a, a big limitation in small to medium companies because either they don't understand it that well, or they don't know how to bring it to the executive in a tool set that helps them make better choices. Yeah, you know the good thing, the good thing about about what we're talking about here actually. Uh, comes from Ernest Hemingway, believe it or not, when he said that how did the great I, cash philosopher, the, the great writer of about cash, is that correct? Calm the farm. We'll explain. Um, what he said is, uh, how did I go bankrupt? Slowly, 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 then really quickly. I told I you it. it would come back to that. Right. But that's okay. the point. That's the point. If you're growing broke, if you're seeing <clears throat> and don't yeah. understand cash, like it's happening really slowly and you have the opportunity before everything unwinds really quickly. So you have the opportunity to begin to work on this stuff. A great example was, was your friend that flew to Chicago um, yeah. and simply how you can understand the mechanisms and then you can begin to unwind the things that are, that are structurally making this happen. Yeah. And it's, it's about understanding and awareness. And most people are undereducated in this area. I had um, dinner the other night with uh, a friend of mine, entrepreneur who had sold his business recently, and he's a, 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 a CPA. And that's why CPAs are often very good entrepreneurs if they have that drive, because they understand the business and the game. But we were talking about this, about his business. And he said, you know, when I finally figured out figured out I needed to run my business through the balance sheet. Yeah. I needed to look at it, restructure it and squeeze the balance sheet. And it almost drove a whole bunch of decisions on the income statement and other parts of the business. He said, but it wasn't until I really learned how to manage the business through the balance sheet, thinking about it through the balance sheet that I really became a really good CEO and did a great job of building the company. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, way to put it and a good way to introduce this concept of competing or fighting for capital. Yes. So there's a company that I work with here and they were looking at opening a new office in an area, a uh, retail business, uh, a store in a new area. Um, and I, th they were kind of emotionally invested. It was a bit of a luxury destination and they were going to head down there. And I said to them, okay, so what are the other options? If you're going to, let's say, spend $2 million to open up that storefront, what are the other options that are available? Uh, and they hadn't even thought about it. And it's like, well, how do we, we need to develop an environment where we get the capital to, to compete for other or against other ideas for the best outcome. And so we, we introduced that idea and then they decided, okay, that won't produce a great outcome. Like it, it, it may look good and it may feel good, but number one, there's no staff there, like very, very hard to get staff. The customers were going into a, 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 an area where there's really strong competition. So we couldn't guarantee it. So using this, the criteria that we use there, we actually opened a 
office in a better area uh, or a store in a better area. And it's it's not performing awesome, but it's getting compounding improvements over time. It's the same with any of the cash decisions that we're making. We want to yes. think about what is the capital that we need to invest and what's five other ideas that we could use to help us live our purpose, stick within our hedgehog, whatever it is, if we're making investments. Yeah. And actually interesting, another CEO that I'm working with is doing this just now. And they're going to have the team do like a dragon's den style thing where they all make their pitches for how they want to see capital invested. And then they're giving parameters of about seven different variables that they also need to make their case based on. Yeah. Profitability, cash generation, risk, um, other resources required, return on invested capital. They, they, they have a bunch of variables to look at. So it extracts some really good ideas. But more than that, it trains people that let the best idea win. And it's not just cash, but you got to take into it's not just generating cash, but it's one of the key things to do it. Um, it's interesting. We had a, a strat planning meeting for a client recently the other day. And when we're doing the planning meeting, one of the execs says, look, and, and the business is a little bit tight on cash because they're growing quickly and they have lots of things they're investing in. And one of the, one of the, uh, we'll call it like a, like, it's like, a, not called a president, but it's like a president of a division said, Hey, you know, if you give me $3 million more cash, I can produce notably more profit. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, show me the money. Let, show me. And so we spent total of 180 seconds. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, good, done deal. So what he explained, and I, I know already know and trust his judgment. So this is not a stranger. I know the guy. I trust him. He's a CPA as well. So he's, you know, and he knows his numbers and he knows the business. He says, look, if you give me $3 million in the first year, I'll produce you know, at least $2 million of additional profit with that $3 million of capital. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, and what about year five? $3 million, year 10, minimum $3 million of profit. So we're just saying, you're just saying, we can give you $3 million today. You'll give us at least two in 2023. And mm -hmm. every year thereafter, 3 million on 3 million. I go, yep. I go, good. What other ideas you got? Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a that's a 100% return on capital annually. Yeah. That's a, like that those are as good as ideas get. You get 3 million on your 3 million? Okay. That's great. Yeah. That's that's a kind of that those are hitting it out of the park. And again, context that here we already know the guy, trust the guy, all this other stuff. But he had the answers and it was an easy easy point of no it's not my decision, it's the CEO's decision and he was also agreeing. Okay. But you, you got you got to rank a lot of other really good ideas. You got to have a lot of you got to have a spectacular idea with shooting fish in the barrel uh, probability of success. You know to 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 trump that idea for him not to get the capital. Yeah, I got a slightly different story to that. Um, I walk into a business. Uh, I, I kind of know these guys for a while. I walk into a business uh, last year, and they. They they said, all right, so we're currently at nine or ten million dollars in revenue per annum. Okay. And so our goal is to get to 50 million in three years. Okay, that's a that's a good goal. Yep. And so you may be interested in what my gut says um when I when I hear that and then I look out the window at the um, you know, the three million dollars worth of stock that's in your warehouse. <laughs> How are you going to fund that growth? Like that's just intuition because you, you know, how much money are you prepared to spend to achieve that $50 million? Because it's not going to, you know, your business model does not suck cash. Uh, sorry. It does not spin off cash. It sucks it cash. It sucks cash. Right. So every dollar that you sell, and this is so important to the cash conversation, it every is. dollar that you sell above your $10 million amount there's a certain amount of sense that you need to invest to make that dollar of sale. And so we kind of did a quick and dirty analysis of that, but it's so important to understand what is your, uh, what, what is the working capital requirement if you're going to grow the business in 23? Yes. 
And then the second part is what can you do about it? Come back to this, um, the, the, the oh, four. So much. Well, one of the parts is the, the, the cash conversion cycle, right? The four components, which is yeah. um, the sales cycle. So that is from the time when we say, hello, my name yep. is Brad. Improve the sales cycle. Yeah. From the time, the time you we, spend a dollar. Yep. Yep. To the time when you get an order. And then the next part uh, is the make and production um, cycle where we're making the goods. The third is the delivery cycle. How many days does that take? And then there's the accounting or billing cycle. So all up from the time when you first meet a prospect until the time you've got the cash in the bank across those four cycles, it could be, I don't know, it could be 40 days, 100 days, 150. We don't yeah. know. but Or minus 27. Oh, that'd be Michael Dell, wouldn't it? Minus 42 is what Dell, Dell went bankrupt. Dell learned some lessons about cash in their life cycle and um, they almost went bankrupt and they found a massive innovation, which today is normal for mm. us, but they took their cash conversion cycle from, I think it was about 60 days in that neighborhood and they got it down to minus 42 days. That's six weeks because of a few major things. Just in time inventory, and I did a tour of the Dell facilities probably 15 years ago. And at that time, they were still building a lot of desktops. And there was about four hours of inventory in the building at any given time. Hours. So on top of that, um, they they got credit card payments. So customers paid when the computer was ordered, and it would take you know a bit of time to ship it. And so based on the terms they negotiated with the suppliers, getting paid up front, which was a massive innovation back in the day, yeah, they got down to minus 42 days and it was spectacular. And the thing about minus 42 days is you can grow as fast as you want Yeah. because the business generates infinite cash as long as it's profit, as long as it's profitable and you have good margins. On the other end of it, sometimes if you have a 150 day cash conversion cycle, your business may only be able to grow 7% per year without external capital. If you have a seven day cash seven, instead of cash uh, a cash conversion cycle, your business can probably grow infinite at 45 days. Again, depending on the model and your inventory and all these other variables, the point of it is the more you improve your cycle, the faster you can grow without external capital. And most businesses should generate cash as they grow. Mm. But the ones that need external cash, uh, normally it's because they have a really long cash conversion cycle. And, and you know, if you have high enough margins and et cetera, it might be worth it. But learning how to tweak the model like Dell did or lots of other examples that we can share can notably improve the cash required to run your business. I think and that, that, is, that gives you infinitely better returns because you have less <clears throat> invested capital. Even if you had the same profit, you have less invested capital. So your return on invested capital, which is, I think my, everything I understand is the number one number in business. It's the number one number to know how good the CEO is. Um, less cash, same profit means a better return. I think what's really important is that for those who may not be too familiar with cash, very specifically, what you're talking about here is the cash conversion cycle days, not accounts receivable days. No. So this is not how long does it take your customers to pay, although no. that's one small component of it. This is from the very beginning of a sale, when it's the the, the very, very beginning, when we start to interact with a customer right through until we've got their money in the bank. How many days does that take? And then how can we reduce that using whatever yeah. means possible? How many times does it take for the whole money wheel to spin? And the major factor in all of this, the biggest thing that um, we see in companies that are inventory based is that they it's easy to build up inventory. Then your customers are always happy. It's easy. Again, inventory <laughs> is a dangerous thing. And even sometimes it takes companies a month to get an invoice out. Well, a month to get an invoice out, let's just say you're a, you know, a hundred, a hundred million dollar business, hundred million in revenue. Yep. Um, if it takes you a month to get an invoice out, that means, and if, and if it didn't have to be that long, 
that that is eight point uh, eight eight point three million dollars of cash just required to fund the month that yeah. it takes to get the invoices out the door. If you invoiced in one day and assuming you know your collections were based on when you invoiced, you would need 8.3 million less cash to operate your business, or there would be 8.3 million dollars more cash in your bank. And you know, I got an example of I probably hundreds of millions of dollars we've been able to put back into their current accounts from companies I work with. I had one, it was a travel agency. And uh, we called this, we had this theme that we did to improve cash called Route 66. Yeah. Their, their average time their customers paid from, in, from, from transaction date until money in the bank was over 90 days. We wanted to drive that part of the cash conversion cycle down to under 66. Truly, we wanted 60. But Route 66 was memorable and there's a song and a road. So we did this whole thing and we got the whole organization obsessed about this from the invoicing clerks right through to the people collecting it and the customer service agents that talk to people. And in a month, uh, we were able to pull pull the, the, the cash cycle, or the, that part of the cash cycle from over 90 to under 66. I think we hit 59 point something days, yeah. uh, which was spectacular. And again, that put one month sales back in the bank. So if they were doing 30 million a year, that meant two and a half million dollars went into the bank. The bank went up by two and a half million dollars. And why do you need that? It's not it's not to go and invest in other ventures. It's so that your business is stronger. So that so yes. that Imagine if you were going to, and you were looking at the stock market and you were going to invest in a company and you, you look through their financials and you saw, oh, they've got uh, three weeks of cash reserves. So that means that if something stops, basically all of the, the wheels stop after three weeks, they've got no money to pay. You would never, ever invest in that company. And the problem is, is that most small to medium businesses operate within that, that range. Yes. Those, listed companies would be a year or more's worth of cash, if not two. I remember Microsoft, excuse me, Bill Gates always insisted through all years they would never have less than one year's worth of cash reserves because he knew that's the thing that unwound businesses all the time. So yep. looking at 2023, really we're saying consider your cash conversion cycle days, consider some of the other areas of cash, but then the other part of it is, um, how much cash reserves do you have? And then yeah. firstly, to, we to weather the potential storm that is 2023, but to improve that position. There's no end of people who want to come in and sell your stuff. There's a person who wants to come in and sell you their property investments of course. or their you know, investment in their company or whatever, whatever it is. But the best investment is a stronger more resilient cash reserve in your business. Yep. So there's lots of other examples. I want to share one thing, one just thought on this is that, you know, the return um, on uh, invested capital is a critical number to pay attention to. So in companies that we get smarter with cash, we look at cash conversion days. So we use less capital running the business. Second thing we do is we start to track return on invested capital for all of our investments and the company overall, so we can start to see where our cash works hard for us and where our cash is underutilized. Go back to show me the money, like I said at the beginning of the show. Is is it's in one of the companies I worked with, we've been working on it hard for three, four years. And I'm telling you, we are making better decisions by the day, or by the quarter, by the month, by the week, because we're looking at both. Um both profitability and return on invested capital. So we're running a more efficient business on a regular basis. And we made some decisions that have surprised us. It's um, yeah. Last, la last, uh, what, last example I would like to share on this though, is that, you know, the thing to help with cash a lot of the times is better data to understand it and people paying attention to running the processes better, like really running the processes better and not getting loose on things that really matter. And you know, one of my clients, whenever the economy turns, and they're they've been through a lot of turns over their years, you know, when it comes to a tight economy, they automatically get tighter on credit. 
like they put tighter credit terms and don't give credit to just everyone so they don't get stuck with sales that haven't got paid as he said it it's only counts as a sale when the money comes in the bank <laughs> not when the salesperson signs a contract second thing is is that they normal hi normally hire more people on the credit end of it for the collections of the receivables collections yeah. is labor and a lot of work and so in the market we coming out of people would put extra resources into hr for hiring and recruiting in his case, he would always then start to move those resources to the collections team so that they were the one getting paid. There's that old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, making sure they're getting paid by their customers. And it's not because they haven't been following up and communicating well with those people. Who on your leadership team owns cash, CFO, accountant, whoever it is, maybe, and how strong are they at defending the cash Yes. Requirements. Because if you're in a leadership team meeting, for example, in exec meeting, and someone comes up with a new harebrained scheme and it's going to cost a amount of money or it's going to affect the CCC days or whatever it is, who is fighting the good fight from the cash yeah. front? Because that is, look, it's everybody's job, but mostly we want the accountant, the financial controller to be the CFO, to be the one that's saying, hold on a second. If we do that, that is going to have this ramification, A, on profit, but moreover on cash. Like, great idea. How do you plan to fund that? How do you plan to execute that without destroying our cash reserves? Someone needs to be yes. arguing that point regularly. And educating the team on how that works. Oh, yeah, of course. Because people just don't know. It's, it's awesome. And it's, yeah, awesome. Cash, cash, cash. Show me the money. The whole idea and everything we're talking about is get better at generating cash, get better at evol evaluating things that either generate or consume cash so you can build up the war chest, the balance sheet, whatever it is, so that you can be ready to handle any kind of storm that comes up. And we know we're probably going into a storm, but just how, how do you have more cash? And cash allows you to stick to your values and stick to your strategy and take care of your customers. It gives you, cash allows you to be able to fight the next battle and not get taken out by the one that you're in. Very good. Very good. Awesome. So thanks for listening, everyone. This has been the Growth Whispers with Brad Giles up, down, however you want to look at it, in Perth, Australia. And I'm Kevin Lawrence in Vancouver. Is, is it up? Up? Yeah, up, up, up? It's upside down up. That's right. Uh, Kevin Lawrence up in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, to subscribe to the podcast, just go to wherever you're listening. Click subscribe. Happy for you to give it a rating. Recommend it. Take an episode, share it with someone you know that might find it valuable. Uh, for the video version, uh, go to youtube.com and search The Growth Whispers. And uh, Brad and I both put a lot of energy into sharing what we know because we believe in abundance and we like to share. We're very fortunate to learn lots from the wonderful companies we work with. So Brad's newsletter uh, comes out weekly. Lots of ideas and insights to share. Uh, that's at evolutionpartners.com.au. And mine you can find at lawrenceandco.com. Again, both of us, weekly newsletters, lots of resources, and here to help. Have a great week. Show me the money. I think Jerry McGuire helping us to run our businesses better. All right, have a good one.